to communicate in Chinese, many skills need to work in unison. But trying to improve all of them at once is a recipe for frustration. Instead, limit your focus to make progress and stay motivated. Hello and welcome to the Hacking Chinese podcast. In this week's episode, we are going to talk about the importance of limiting your focus when practicing Chinese, which will enable you to make quicker progress and to stay motivated while doing so. As I said in the introduction, in order to be able to communicate in Chinese, there are many smaller skills that need to come together and they need to work in unison for you to be able to speak, listen, read, and write. For example, when you are speaking, you need to make sure your word order is intelligible. You need to pick the right words, but not only that, you also need to deliver this, i.e., you need to pronounce these words in a way that the listener can understand. And of course, you can divide this as much as you want. So you can split pronunciation into your ability to pronounce the initials, the finals, and the tones, or maybe prosody in general. And we can get even more specific. We can talk about specific tones, specific tone pairs. Or Tones in specific contexts, and so on. I'm not saying that you have to master everything in order to be able to communicate. Obviously, that is not the case. But it is the case that there are many different areas that need to come together for you to be able to produce Chinese that is intelligible to someone else. And indeed, the opposite is also true. In order to understand what somebody else says, there are many different skills that you need to develop. Something I discuss at great length in my series Beyond Tingbodong, and I'll put a link to the first episode in that series in the description of this episode. This leads to an interesting problem because even though there are many things that need to work in order for communication to be successful, you can't really practice all of these at once, or you can't at least consciously focus on all of them at once. That simply doesn't work. So the question then is: Should you focus on one of these things at a time? Or should you try to focus on everything at once, even though it's hard? And this is the question that I want to explore in this week's episode. Let's start by zooming out a bit, because the issue of having too many things to focus on at once is, of course, not limited to language learning. I've encountered this in many different areas of life, and I'm sure that you have too. And I've picked one that I think is apt for this episode, namely my experience with learning Tai Chi Chuan. Which also happens to be tied in with how I started learning Chinese in the first place, which you will know if you listen to episode 128, how I learned Chinese part one, where it all started. So Tai Chi Chuan or Tai Chi, as it's usually pronounced in English, is a Chinese martial art, and you can do lots of things with it. But what I'm going to focus on here is competitions in form. And form here refers to both hand form, which would be unarmed, and weapon forms, which could be with spear, sword, saber, and so on. So when you compete, there is a set of criteria that is being used to judge your performance, and your final score is then all these taken together. And just to name a few examples, these are things like intent and focus, martial spirit, and coordinated movements. And these can then also be subdivided into further, more specific things, just like we can divide any skill into any number of further subskills. The problem is, of course, that when you practice Tai Chi Chuan, and we assume now that the goal would be to get a good score in a competition, you can't focus on all these ten criteria at once. The human mind simply doesn't work like that. So if you try, you will end up thinking about one or two, then jump to a third and a fourth. But there's simply no way you can focus on ten different things at once while performing any kind of complex task. Indeed, focusing on more than one of the criteria at any given time is hard. A better approach would be to select one of the criteria, presumably one you're not doing very well with, and you practice that for a while until you notice some substantial progress. And this might be for an hour or a day or a week. It depends on the situation. And then you switch to another criteria, work on that, and then you cycle through the ten criteria to make sure that your overall game is where it's supposed to be. And then you compete. And of course, when you compete, you don't think about all these ten, but since you've worked on them independently, your overall performance will have improved. And this is exactly what it's like when learning Chinese too. And this is especially true for speaking and writing. But I also think it is true, but to a more limited extent, when it comes to reading and listening. 
Just to give you an example with speaking, it's simply not possible to try to focus on choosing the right words while you also try to pay attention to your tones, while you're also being mindful of grammar, and at the same time you're also supposed to navigate the conversation you're in, pay attention to what the other person is saying, and so on. If you try to focus on all these things at once, the only likely result is frustration. So the general advice I want to offer in this episode is to limit your focus when trying to improve in Chinese. There are two reasons to do this, and I've kind of mentioned both of them, but let's spell them out to make it even more clear. So the first one is a cognitive one, and that is that it's simply not possible to focus on more than one thing at a time. And if you try to do that, the likelihood is that you end up focusing on nothing, or focusing on so many different things that you are actually not focusing on anything in particular. The second reason it's good to limit your focus is related to motivation. Because once you are no longer a beginner, you won't really notice progress as much as you did when you were a beginner, and by limiting your focus you make your progress much more visible. One way of looking at it is to say that you have a limited amount of progress that you make in the language, and if you spread this out over every single thing that you need to learn, the amount of progress in each small area is so small that you won't notice it. And of course, according to the law of diminishing returns, if you already know a lot and you add just a little bit to that, that really won't make a noticeable impact. Whereas if you know nothing as a beginner and you add just a little bit, that will mean a huge difference, relatively speaking, and this is very noticeable. If you want to learn more about this intermediate plateau and how to get past it, we talked about that in episode 48. So let's have a look at the process of limiting your focus and then shifting focus to something else and then overall making progress. First, let's imagine a number of vertical bars showing your skill in different areas of learning Chinese. And we don't need to label these bars, they just represent some kind of skill in some area. And like I've said before, we could have a hundred bars, we could have three, it all depends on how you split your ability to communicate in Chinese. Now, these bars will be of different length, representing your ability in Chinese, which is presumably not perfectly balanced. You are better at some things than others. While it's hard to issue blanket advice in this situation, I think it's usually the case that it makes sense to focus on the weakest links first. And this is because communication in a foreign language is much like a chain, so if one link is very weak and it breaks, well, communication is not possible. And then it doesn't matter that one of the other links is made of super strong unobtainium or something. So, to use a practical example, it doesn't really matter that your grammar is flawless if you don't know the words you need to communicate about a certain topic. Or it doesn't help that your initials and finals are native-like if your grammar is so mixed up that nobody understands what you're saying anyway. The idea of focusing on the weakest link first is something that makes sense in other contexts too, although this is of course not always true. In some cases it can be the opposite, that your strongest skill is what determines success, but I don't think that communicating in Chinese is such an example. And if you're interested in learning more about this outside language learning, you can look up winner's game and loser's game, and this is essentially what we're talking about here, and in those terms communicating in Chinese would be a loser's game, meaning that avoiding really bad outcomes or very weak links is more important than strengthening your already strong areas. It can be rather demanding to focus on your weakest link, because we naturally tend to focus on things we are already doing quite well, because it feels good to be good at something, right? But in fact, we are most often best off focusing on the things we're not doing so well on. This is something I have written about before in an article called Escaping the Convenience Trap to Learn More Chinese, and I'll put a link in the description. So let's look closer at the process here. What are we actually doing when we're focusing on something and how does that help us to improve? And the first thing to notice here is that usually when you focus on one specific thing, you're doing better with that specific thing compared to if you're not focusing on it. 
And in terms of learning Chinese, this is easy to see when teaching, say, pronunciation, because if you ask a student to focus on tones, for example, they will usually do better on tones than if they don't focus on it. And this is not strange, because there are so many things to focus on, as we've seen already, and if you focus on, well, selecting the right words, or if you're worried about the other person's facial expressions, or you're focusing on something completely different, well, then your tones are going to suffer. But if you do your best, you ignore everything else, then your tones will usually be better. If you then keep focusing on something for a while, you will get better at that specific thing. This is how learning works in general, and this is no exception. This means that if you want to improve your tones, and you focus on tones when you speak, you receive feedback, you practice, you listen, you mimic, and so on, all with a focus on tones, you will improve your tones. There's nothing strange about that. How much or how long you need to focus on something to make significant progress, of course, depends on who you are, how much you know, and, well, what you mean by significant progress. A beginner will make huge improvements in the pronunciation just by spending an hour on it, whereas if an advanced student with very good pronunciation spends an hour focusing on pronunciation, it probably won't make any noticeable difference whatsoever. I don't believe there are problems that can't be fixed, though, but fossilization can make the time requirements rather daunting. And this is something I've discussed on the podcast before, so if you learn the third tone correctly from the start, it requires a certain amount of time and effort, and if you wait two years before realizing how it's supposed to be pronounced, like I did, you need considerably more time and effort to achieve exactly the same result. So I can't really tell you how much time you should spend and what significant progress is for you, but from a motivational point of view, it makes sense to focus on one thing until you notice some progress. Exactly how much that is depends on how long you want to focus on something and also, of course, like I've said, your Chinese ability in general. I also want to caution against spending too much time on any given area and trying to achieve a perfect result, because perfection is rather inefficient, because those last few percent has a really low return on your invested time and effort, and so usually it's good to stop short of that. For the perfectionists out there, I suggest you check out my article When Perfectionism Becomes an Obstacle to Learning Chinese, and as usual, I'll put a link in the show notes. Okay, so let's continue. You've now spent time working on something, maybe tones, maybe grammar, maybe prosody, maybe something else. And now you're ready to move on. The first thing you will notice is that as soon as you focus on something else, your performance in that previous area, tones, grammar, or whatever it was, will decrease. So if you remember the bars we had to represent our ability, you will be able to pull one of them up a bit, but as soon as you focus on something else, it will go down again. And this is usually very frustrating, it doesn't feel good, and you might get the idea that you haven't learned anything, because as soon as you stopped focusing on tones, you were back to where you began. But this is very rarely the case. In fact, you have automated some of the processes that were needed to produce tones correctly when you speak, and that will stay with you, even if you don't focus on tones for the moment. Yes, it's true that your performance is worse than when you focused on it exclusively, but it's also true that your performance when you're not focusing is better now than it was before you started practicing your tones. So essentially what you're doing is that you're pulling each of these bars up a bit, and as soon as you stop focusing on it, it will go down, but it will not go down to the same low level, it will be slightly higher. You move to another bar, you raise that one, and then when you focus on the third one, the second one will go down too, but it also will stop at a higher level than it started. That way you can cycle through all these skills, make significant progress, keep motivated while doing so, and still you increase your overall performance. And if we relate this back to the Taiji Chen I talked about, you practice one of the criteria, you practice, say, smooth and fluid motions, until you feel you've made progress with that criteria. And then you move on to something else, let's say coordinated movements. And what you will notice then, or what somebody else will notice, because you won't think about it, is that your smooth and fluid motions that you had developed will become less fluid and less smooth, because you're now focusing on something else. But that is fine, because the idea is that you're still better than you were when you started focusing on it.
And like I hinted at here, it's usually necessary to get some kind of feedback from someone else, usually a teacher, because you are not able to do all these things while also evaluating how you're doing these things. That's another layer you add to an already complex task. The problem here is that most teachers are not aware of the things that I'm talking about in this episode, at least in my experience. I'd like to show what I mean by using another sports analogy, and this is also a real one that I've experienced myself, and this is when I practiced diving. I had a coach who was really good at analyzing things and he gave excellent advice in general, but the problem was that he never stuck to one specific thing. So in one dive he might say something like, yeah, you should start twisting earlier. So I went again and tried to fix that, but now he comments on something completely different. And so again I try to fix that, but then he comments on a third thing that is unrelated to the earlier two things. And as a student this is extremely frustrating. You don't get feedback if you actually fix the thing that your coach pointed out the first time, and you didn't even get more than one chance to fix it. What I would have preferred here is of course to do, let's say, 10 dives and focus on only one thing, and to make sure I made progress with that specific thing, and then move on to the other things. This is something I try to be mindful of when teaching and coaching Mandarin pronunciation. So if I point something out to a student, maybe they are getting a tone wrong or something, I will then give them ample opportunity to fix that specific thing with feedback from me before I mention anything else. If I don't do that, the result might be something like this, and this is sadly something I've experienced many times myself as a student, so this is fairly common. Teacher. The tone was wrong for this word, it should be a low tone. And the student tries again, focusing on that tone. Teacher. You're not hitting the U sound here, you should round your lips more. Student tries again, focusing on the U sound. Teacher. The prosody is a bit robotic, try to make it flow more. Student tries again, focusing on prosody. Teacher. Your third tone on that first word is still off. And at this point the student explodes out of frustration. So if somebody keeps shifting the focus for you like this, and this is common like I said, I've experienced it in sports, in language learning and in many other areas, the best advice I have to offer is to try to discuss it directly with the teacher. Politely tell them that you think that it's too hard to focus on so many things at once and that you'd prefer to focus on one or two things at a time. And by putting the blame on yourself for not being able to deal with more things at once, even though this, I think, is actually the teacher's fault, you make this socially a lot more acceptable. You can also say that you are interested in fixing all these other things that the teacher helped you point out, and you can write them down and make a point of that, because of course at some point you actually do want to fix these things, it's just that you don't want to fix everything at once. If this doesn't work, I would look for a new teacher, and if this isn't an option, you can just start ignoring advice beyond the first one offered and just focus on that. Before I wrap this episode up, I'd like to say a few words about how narrowly you should focus. And this is indeed something that is quite difficult, but I think in general, the more advanced your Chinese is, the more narrow your focus should be. I've already explained this from a motivational point of view, because if your focus is too broad and you're an advanced student, the effort you invest will not enable you to make noticeable progress, which is certainly not good for motivation. I should say though that this is not only about motivation, because if you can't tell the difference between before and after you focus on something, well then you don't actually know if the method you're using is very good. And naturally this is not easy even if you do make noticeable progress, but at least it's possible to evaluate if you can notice the progress you are making. The situation for a beginner is of course very different, because you notice that you're making progress whatever you do, so this is not really a concern. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't limit your focus though, so for example I've argued elsewhere, and I'll put a link in the description to this, it's episode 1 of the podcast, that delaying writing and reading is usually a good idea because it allows you to make quicker progress in speaking and listening. But then again, from a motivational standpoint, you don't have to do this, because usually beginners feel that they are making lots of progress, and then the motivational aspect is not as important. There are other reasons to focus on the spoken language first, naturally, but those I focused on in episode 1, so check that out if you are interested.
Finally, I'd like to suggest that you check out Hacking Chinese Challenges if you want to limit your focus monthly and focus on one area of learning Chinese. Usually, the challenges focus on rather broad aspects of learning Chinese, such as reading ability or listening ability, but occasionally we also do focus on more specific things, such as pronunciation or, say, handwriting. This month there is a reading challenge on, and it's not too late to join if you haven't already, it's completely free and easy to do. Just head over to challenges.hackingchinese.com. And if you are listening to this in the future, you can still head over there to see what challenge is on when you are listening. Thank you for tuning in to the Hacking Chinese podcast. If you like this episode, please share it. More information and inspiration about learning and teaching Chinese can be found at hackingchinese.com. See you in the next episode, and until then, good luck with your studies.